should be um, all invited to discuss the best way to harness the industrialization opportunities offered by the African free trade area in the context of the digital age. Um, the session is organized by the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, two of its departments, uh, IDEC, which is the Institute for Economic Development and Planning, which is a training institute and the training arm of ECA, and the ATPC, the African Trade Policy Center. I would like you to join me in greeting the eminent members of this panel, His Excellency Ambassador Ajay Kumar from Leo, my left, AUC permanent representative. To the right, Mr. David Pluk, who is the coordinator of the ATPC of the ECA. Mr. Ratnakar Adhikari, director of the Enhanced Integrated Framework at WTO. And to the far right, His Excellency Ambassador Leopold Ismail Samba, representative of the Central African uh, Republic and coordinator of the LTC group that we will have the opportunity to talk about LTCs and how they position themselves in this whole process. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, the very first phase of uh, a, the African trade, uh, free trade area negotiation culminated, as you all know, on the 21st of March, which I found it uh, uh, excellent auspices because uh, in this part of the world, 21st of March is the first day of spring. So if we want a rebirth of Africa's integration through trade, uh, we couldn't choose the, uh, uh, best, uh, uh, a better date. Uh, the second start of the negotiation is to start in January and we look at issues such as services, e-commerce, IPRs, etc. Uh, the AFCTA is uh, an opportunity for African countries to build a unique market of uh, more than one billion people, young people, more and more organized people who uh, could be tomorrow the uh, consumers of what the uh, free trade area could provide. The relation between trade and industry is no longer to be demonstrated, and we consider that the launch of the uh, AFCTA is another opportunity offered to Africa, an opportunity, an additional one, but one that the continent cannot afford to miss. Uh, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, after the enthusiasm of uh, the post-independence uh, era, African countries globally, I don't know whether I should say failed, maybe if you want to say, uh, to, to see the, the, the cup half full, I should say, didn't all succeed in developing a vibrant, competitive, and uh, job creator industry and to transform and sustain their economies in that context. We think that this was not because Africa didn't embark on industrialization programs, but maybe because the countries didn't make the right choices, maybe because uh, then the industrialization was mainly led by governments where the private sector had little space, especially uh, when we consider the very nation local private sector, because access to finance and financial services was either limited or inadequate, and because sometimes regulations took over innovation and creativity and industrialization cannot expand as it was expected to. Uh, I'm sure my uh, panelists will give you a lot of indicators and figures, but let me just share with you three of them, uh, some coming from uh, ECA work, ATPC and ECA work, others from EDEC research. Uh, with the removal of uh, tariffs on goods, the share of intra-African trade is expected to increase by almost 40%, yeah, I'm speaking under your control, and could reach 50% depending on the tariff liberalization scenario. 
In the same vein, the value of intra-African trade would increase by 15%, especially mainly driven by intermediate goods. And if we rely on uh, a research work uh, just uh, conducted by EDEC, uh, the, the impact of uh, the free trade area on GDP growth could vary from uh, the lowest figure would be 1.3%, for Central African region, up to 2.6% for the Southern African region, if uh, well combined with w, uh, WTO trade facilitation agreements. So, from that perspective, we have shown that the implementation of the trade facilitation agreement, combined with the CFTA, could magnify the trade and the impact of industrialization of the continent. Tariffs, of course, matters, but trade cost matters as well. So today, with uh, the booming of information technology, uh, one is to consider how African countries can see and approach their industrialization in the information age. Something like 20 <coughs> years ago, African countries, under the leadership of the uh, Economic Commission for Africa, launched what well, is called the African Information Society Initiative. This was owned and led and uh, implemented differently from country to country. Uh, the initiative was aiming at preparing the entry of African countries into the digital age. And the different approaches led, of course, to different results. And uh, you have certainly heard regularly uh, the case of Rwanda being cited as a good practice in this area because Rwanda decided that the rebuilding of its country should mainly rely on the utilization of digital facilities, digital services, and this has led to the good ranking of the country in a number of international uh, areas. So today the booming of uh, things like the Internet of Things, Big data, the data revolution, the unprecedented development and deployment, because development doesn't always go with deployment, but access is more and more uh, uh, easily uh, performed in Africa. So the deployment of new technologies, the interest of our countries uh, into green, or I should say greener industry, because since we are well known at, as not being among the worst polluters, what we uh, can do is to uh, further develop the green aspect of our economy, the development of blue economy, all these are offering today new opportunities that we have to seize. So, with this new environment, how can the uh, African continental free trade area ensure that we are no longer in a sort of business as usual posture vis-a-vis -vis industrialization and vis-a-vis -vis the utilization of industrial development to transform our economy and in fine to benefit people. Uh, how can the, the, the free trade area ensure we are moving to a new and more creative phase of Africa's development story? Uh, a story where we are the writers to change, a story where the youth are trained in such a way that they can find decent and durable <coughs> jobs and no longer see themselves forced to join the informal economy, a story where women are fully involved and empowered and could bring um, informal trade to the formal sector, a story where cities become friendlier and better planned <coughs> to conjugate pleasant living conditions and host at the same time competitive activities that create more value and can integrate into regional and global value chains. A story where innovation and technological changes are harnessed in support of pro-development strategies. And finally, a story where African countries can move to higher ranks in international indices of course, those relating to doing business are the first one one has in mind, but in fine, what we want is also to be ranked very highly in 
human development indices, governance, fight against corruption, and the uh, improvement in environmental conditions. At the same time, African countries need to strengthen their capacity to measure their readiness, both individually and regionally, to trade differently, to transform through industry, and to embrace the digital economy in line with the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and Africa 2063 Agenda. <laughs> so with all this in mind, appropriate measures are to be put in place to support um, the, the free trade area full implementation, because in fact, a free trade area is not something that you decree. It is something that you build, that you build wisely, creatively, so that it becomes a reality that contributes and benefits to the living, uh, the well-living of everybody and of course, leaving no one. <coughs> so some of you may say this is quite a challenging program, especially after some of the, 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 the mixed evaluation that we have made of, of the recent progresses. But I can't agree with you when you say that this is challenging. It is up to us, all the actors, to make it happen. And as, if you want, uh, allow me to quote President Isufu, who is the champion of the African free trade area, we must be strong at home if we want to be strong abroad. And by building this free trade area, we will be able to become more competitive and a full actor integrated in the global economy. So, let me now turn to our panelists and invite them to share their views about these issues and many more. And the first one to take the floor would be uh, Ambassador Brakeo as the representative of the AUC, AUC being the main conductor, especially at the political level. And you may wish, Ambassador, to set the scene to tell us what are the challenges, what has been done so far, and what is planned for the coming months so that our member states, both as government but also with all the stakeholders, can become more equipped to fully um, establish the uh, free trade uh, area, to develop Africa's industrial uh, capacity, and to do it in line with the recent development taking place uh, as vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the digital page. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. And uh, let me uh, greet the Excellencies, distinguished fellow panelists, uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to express my appreciation to the organizers for uh, making this uh, session happen. It's an extremely important and topical issue that we are addressing today. And I'm hoping to, during my intervention, provide an overview of the um, situation on the African continent post the, the launch of the um, CFTA. The creation of the continental free trade area uh, at the historic summit held in Kigali in March uh, 2018 <coughs> constitutes the legal framework for the establishment of the Pan-African Common Market in accordance with the 1991 Abuja Treaty. In Kigali, we had a number of African countries signing uh, the uh, Free Trade Area Agreement, um, creating a single African market <coughs> to, uh, in which we are going to have the free movement of goods, services, finance, and people. To date, we have 49 signatories to the CFTA and seven ratifications. The CFTA is expected to enhance competitiveness of the industry in Africa, especially the SMEs, through the exploitation of opportunities that have been created for scale production, continental market access, and the better allocation of resources. 
the fourth industrial revolution has ushered in some new opportunities for the developing world, but these opportunities are also accompanied by a few daunting challenges. Africa, like other regions, is at a crucial juncture where digital technologies can assist in its structural transformation, but compared to other regions, Africa is slightly more challenged and therefore deserves special attention if the global economy aims to deliver on its agenda 2030. Let me begin with the current state of trade in general in Africa in order to better understand and appreciate how e-commerce may help Africa leapfrog. As we all know, the share of intra-African trade currently stands at between 14 to 18 percent, depending on which source we are looking at for these statistics. And similarly, Africa's share of the world trade is less than 3 percent and has continued to decline in the recent past. For example, exports of goods went down from 2.4% in 2014 to 2.2% in 2015, according to the WTO's Trade Statistical Review of 2017. Now, we know that some of the main reasons for, Af of, for Africa's poor trade performance include the high trade costs, such as the cost of compliance with rules, procedures and documentation, a weak private sector, and the availability or lack thereof of trade information. What we also know is that SMEs, whose contribution to Africa's economy is significant, uh, as it caters for around 80% of employment in Africa, have difficulties connecting to the global markets and supply chains and are the most affected by high trade costs. The complexity of the digital economy will even increase further with the high digital technologies such as the Internet of Things, big data, cloud technology, artificial intelligence, advanced robotics and 3D printing. Africa needs to reduce the gap in order to avoid further marginalization in this new emerging fourth industrial revolution. And this requires a tailored digital industrial policy for catching up. The CFTA will contribute towards enhancing cross-border e-commerce and digital trade between African countries and ultimately between Africa and the rest of the world. <coughs> Firstly, the CFTA agreement provides a framework for attracting investment in the areas of e-commerce and digital trade, as well as boosting production of digital goods and services. In effect, with the creation of an African continental market of 1.3 billion consumers under the CFTA, companies will have more incentives to invest as they will be able to achieve economies of scale in the production of digital goods. These goods would include uh, and, and would be transmitted online such as movies, books, newspapers, music, <coughs> software, etc. As well as a production of digital infrastructure goods which would be providing the hardware to conduct digital trade such as computers, network devices, mobile phones, etc. When you think about it, right now if a business is considering producing digital content for e-commerce, it will be limited by the size of its market, which is so restricted, which is <coughs> sorry, restricted to the national or regional market at best. So the CFTA market will be a contributing factor to the emergence of giant African e-commerce companies which can then compete on equal footing with other e-commerce giants from other parts of the world. I think at the moment uh, there are 14 such major global e-commerce companies based in the US, three in China, 
three in other parts of Asia, and only one on the continent of Africa. The CFTA will also provide a legal framework for the liberalization of cross-border e-commerce and digital trade, which will contribute further <coughs> towards boosting intra-African trade. This could be achieved through the removal of tariffs on digital products as well as digital infrastructure products originating from African countries. Also, in terms of trade in services, through the negotiations of tariffs or schedule of specific commitments under the CFTA, could help boost the cross-border supply of <laughs> digital infrastructure services. The supply of electronically enabled services, such as the sale of e-services, like online insurance, electronic banking, website design, hosting and maintenance, online legal advice, and documentation and taxation services, etc., are all potential areas of e-commerce waiting to be exploited. It is therefore important that African countries bear the above considerations in mind when negotiating market access under the CFTA. This is because the level of ambition will have a bearing on boosting intra-African trade. Lastly, the CFTA will provide a framework for addressing the regulatory and facilitation issues which are critical for e-commerce and the digital trade to flourish. In effect, our heads of state and government have decided that phase two of the CFTA negotiations will focus primarily on investment, intellectual property rights, and competition policy. Negotiating continental rules in those areas will help address some of the main concerns and risks associated with e-commerce, such as privacy, protection of intellectual property rights, and competition to avoid monopolistic and anti-competitive behavior. You will agree with me that given the importance of privacy, competition, and trust as a determining factor of e-commerce, the future of the CFTA protocols on intellectual property rights and competition policy will significantly contribute to creating the most suitable enabling environment for cross-border e-commerce and digital trade to flourish in Africa. However, overall, it will be up to our member states to decide on which path they shall take. E-commerce has the potential to contribute towards increasing intra-African trade and therefore help realize the objectives of boosting intra-African trade uh, action plan. The CFTA as a flagship project of Agenda 2063 uh, is something that the African Union places a lot of um, importance on. And so we can also help boost Africa's share of global trade, which is currently estimated to be under 3%. E-commerce has the potential to boost <coughs> France and countries' participation in regional and global trade. <coughs> Thirdly, e-commerce has the potential to boost exports when the domestic enterprises are able to break into foreign markets to connect with international supply chains. This potential is said to be even greater for the landlocked developing countries which face geographical constraints. E-commerce can lead to better allocation of resources and also improve the competitiveness of businesses in general. Also, e-commerce and digital trade can support entrepreneurship, creativity, and innovation, and encourage the formation and formalization and growth of micro, small, and medium enterprises, especially in our developing countries, in landlocked countries, and in the least developed countries. <coughs> Moreover, e-commerce can promote the integration of the micro, small, and medium enterprises into value chains and markets, including by reducing the investment required by a company 
to become visible in the global marketplace. The application of digitalization in Africa needs a proper introductory time and policy space for us to be able to implement the vision that we have in an effective manner. I thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for this very uh, exhaustive overview of the opportunities that the CFTA offers and uh, the opportunity that it can create for uh, the development of a more vibrant private sector in the continent, provided that the, uh, and the enabling environment is offered for that expansion. Uh, now I will turn to uh, my colleague David Brook. Uh, for the last years, uh, the African Trade Policy Center has been conducting a number of studies and research relating to the CFTH, assessing the potential gains and uh, advising on how to minimize the risk, because we do not live in a risk zero uh, world. So um, I'm inviting David to let us know more about the industrialization opportunities uh, that uh, the uh, CFTA can offer and how uh, Africa can become a full actor of the digital age. Knowing that when we um, discuss trade in general and especially inter-African trade, we tend to uh, promote uh, the, what I would call the made in Africa. Um, so is a made in Africa also possible uh, in the context of the digital age, we have the example of the uh, Eastern Africa uh, born Mpesa. Uh, for the M Banking, we have the uh, well known Nigerian movie um, uh, industry that is relying on the use of internet actually to disseminate its production. So, how can the CFTA further boost? Um, made in Africa in the context of the digital age. David. Thank you, Karima. Good afternoon, Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, colleagues, as we say, uh, on the African continent, all protocols uh, observed. Um, let me uh, begin, perhaps, uh, by following on from um, Ambassador Brandeo's uh, presentation uh, by um, elaborating a bit on the uh, rationale uh, for the uh, AFCFTA. Uh, then to say something about what is in the agreement uh, to drive the industrialization process. And then to come to these issues that you have raised, Karima, in regard to the digital uh, context in which we find, find ourselves, um, and uh, what are the prospects, uh, etc. Um, so, firstly then, what is the rationale of the um, uh, AFCFTA uh, beyond the uh, treaty commitments in the Abuja Treaty, as you heard from Ambassador Brandeo? Um, I would say that the uh, rationale uh, is fundamentally uh, to um, ensure that uh, economies of scale, uh, scope, and investment necessary to develop wide reaching regional value chains and support truly transformational industrialization can happen. Um, the African economies are fragmented into 55, uh, you know, fragmented into 55 uh, countries. Um, in a context where uh, there is a continental population of uh, 1.2 billion, and so a potential market of 1.2 billion. Um, and this population is expected to grow uh, in the next 30 years or so uh, by 2050 to um, uh, 2 billion. Uh, about 300 million Africans, uh, roughly, depending on how you want to read the data, but roughly classified as, uh, as middle class in, in, uh, as of today. Um, continental GDP as of today is uh, 2.6 trillion. So clearly there is a scope uh, to achieve these um, economies uh, that could drive the industrialization process. One thing that you hear from investors is that the African economies 
uh, too small and fragmented uh, to uh, be uh, attractive in, in investment uh, destinations. And when you consider that if you take the uh, largest economies, uh, take um, Nigeria, the largest economy, Nigeria is about 3% uh, of the size uh, in GDP terms of the EU28. Uh, South Africa, the next largest economy, is about 2% of the EU28. Uh, um, so even though uh, much progress has been achieved in the individual regional economic communities, the RECs, in terms of um, uh, trade liberalization, still these economies are too small and too fragmented to uh, drive industrialization, to uh, drive um, investment, and to uh, uh, generate the benefits that come from, from scale. So um, this is what our research finds, that fundamentally uh, the rationale for, the, uh, for this agreement is really to respond to the necessity uh, of the, uh, uh, overcoming the balkanized uh, African uh, market. Now, what is in the agreement in terms of uh, its provisions that could uh, drive the industrialization process? Uh, here are four clusters of issues I would like to alight uh, upon. Uh, first, uh, the agreement targets an ambitious liberalization agenda for trading goods. The modalities that were adopted with the negotiations uh, uh, commit the AU member states to remove 90% of tariff lines on goods imported from other state parties uh, over a period of between 5 and, and 15 uh, years. I underline the word state parties here because um, uh, although this is, uh, the negotiations were conducted among African Union member states, nonetheless uh, the expectation is that uh, only those members of the African Union that have ratified the agreement will become state parties to the uh, agreement. So uh, membership of this agreement is not automatic or a contingent of the uh, member of the AU. Um, the member states have to undertake the commitments. And currently, uh, much work is going on on the ground in terms of revising uh, tariff schedules, in terms of uh, to, to um, uh, fulfill the commitments of the modalities, and in terms of um, uh, making services uh, commitments. Now, my second set of issues uh, in terms of how the agreement can drive industrialization is that the scope of the agreement is beyond the traditional free trade area agreement uh, covering, as you heard from the moderator in the uh, opening uh, statement, uh, and also Ambassador Brandeo, that it covers um, not only trading goods, uh, which is what the traditional FTA does, but it also covers uh, trading services. And then the second phase uh, is focusing on investment intellectual property rights and competition uh, policy. Um, now, these three clusters of issues are extremely important. Um, uh, competition policy, of course, um, would help to level the uh, uh, playing field between big and small actors, uh, uh, foreign players, uh, domestic players. Um, uh, common investment rules uh, would ensure that there's no race uh, to the bottom, so to say. And um, intellectual property rights are important in terms of um, protecting African innovation, but also having a common approach to um, uh, the challenges of um, encountering uh, the uh, industrialization process as what we would call a late, uh, as late uh, developers. Uh, so clearly also having a common framework on how you deal with existing intellectual property rights is uh, uh, important. Then thirdly, the agreement is targeted at addressing uh, key challenges to improve Africa's business environment, including non-tariff uh, barriers, uh, standards, uh, harmonization, customs cooperation, and trade uh, facilitation. Uh, all of these areas have specific provisions and annexes uh, in the agreement that uh, uh, deal with these uh, issues. And these are all important complementary measures uh, that are crucial for boosting industry, uh, enterprise level competitiveness, reducing business costs, and expanding uh, market uh, access. Now my final point as regards um, uh, what's in the agreement to drive the industrialization uh, process is that um, uh, it, the 
agreement taken as a whole is also a complement to the boosting intra-African uh, trade in initiative, which Ambassador Brambia has already uh, talked about. And uh, this is an initiative which recognizes that trade liberalization alone will not do the trick in terms of driving industrialization. Uh, that it would be important to work on a number of other uh, policy areas, including productive uh, capacity, trade-related infrastructure, trade finance, trade info information, <coughs> excuse me, factor market integration, uh, etc. That the number of complementary policy areas that uh, African policymakers have recognized uh, uh, requires ongoing action. Uh, to complement uh, the, um, uh, the CFTA. And uh, this actually, these complementary areas, and actually in these complementary areas, would be crucial to ensuring that there is goods that are made in, made in Africa, as, we, as you said, Karim, uh, uh, where would we see uh, the um, effects uh, in terms of uh, goods being produced made in Africa, but also in terms of um, innovation. Uh, 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 in, in the African context. Now, if I could um, turn to this uh, digital age um, and the challenges that this implies, um, you know, so certainly the, uh, this agreement is uh, going to be implemented um, in a very uh, changed uh, environment, uh, one that is very different uh, from just a few decades um, ago. Um, we all see that the fourth industrial uh, revolution, which some refer to as IR 4.0, is uh, rapidly evolving, transforming the traditional labor intensive uh, path to um, industrialization. But then, on the one hand, uh, it's true that uh, digitalization offers new uh, opportunities for um, trade and industrial uh, leapfrogging in Africa, the digital economy can lower barriers. Uh, to entry, I think you've heard some of these points already from Ambassador Brandeo. It can help um, connect MSMEs uh, with global markets and value chains, uh, digital applications uh, already being leveraged uh, to promote um, innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, mobile and digital solutions, uh, uh, contributing to filling credit uh, gaps uh, and so on. Um, the, the digital economy also offers new possibilities for uh, productive job creation for the youth who are typically quicker at adapting to new technologies and developing new digital uh, solutions. So we're beginning to see some of these things um, happen on the, on the continent. But uh, this is on the plus side. On the negative side, um, we also know that these gains from digitalization, I'll come back to this, uh, uh, point are not uh, automatic, um, and there are these uh, challenges. Um, and uh, firstly, uh, due to the concentration of digital technologies uh, in advanced countries and the skills uh, biased uh, nature of digitalization, the main beneficiaries of the digital economy are currently the most uh, developed uh, countries. And then the risks uh, of reducing the ability for Africa to resolve its um, unemployment uh, problem, uh, given you know, the population, the youth, and, and all that, and take uh, at the traditional low-wage, uh, low-skilled uh, labor-intensive route to uh, industrialization, uh, clearly is a, uh, it's being put at risk by digitalization. Uh, and at the same time, there are concerns that uh, digital training entities, uh, a digital training bodies uh, network effects that can lead to market concentration and anti-competitive uh, issues. Um, and then also digital trade may facilitate international companies to further distort uh, the taxable income to transfer pricing and, and, and so on. So uh, we see all these uh, as a downside of um, what um, one could also say there is a positive uh, outlook uh, on digitalization. Uh, encouragingly, uh, research is showing that um, for um, every job that is lost uh, due to digitalization, about 1.5 new jobs uh, are created. And I, I think those of you <coughs> in the, the opening uh, session um, yesterday of, of the public forum uh, would have encountered uh, some of these uh, details that were being uh, talked about. Um, now let me um, turn to uh, uh, what um, the, uh, the what is required for the uh, AFCFTA to deliver 
on its um, industrialization uh, goal. Um, the issues of how African economies will need to adapt uh, to the new digital climate and uh, innovate uh, in this uh, space. And here I will uh, concentrate on three uh, clusters of uh, uh, issues. Um, uh, firstly, let me just make the general point uh, which uh, Karima also made in uh, introduction. And that is all the modeling work that has been undertaken at uh, ECA um, uh, all have the same result that uh, the, FCF, the FCFT would um, impact welfare, uh, especially through GDP, employment and so on, uh, in a positive uh, way. Uh, also that each uh, country would benefit uh, in one way or the other from the FCFTA. Of course, the modeling results also show that um, some countries will benefit more than others, uh, that's, that's clear. But uh, basically, uh, what we're all saying is that uh, overall welfare will be enhanced. So I think we should just um, uh, put this out there and all of us do this at this point. Um, but uh, to deal with this new environment, it's very clear that um, uh, African countries must uh, come up with a clear uh, digital uh, strategy. Um, because even as the CFTA is, AFCFTA is responding to the small, uh, fragmented domestic uh, markets uh, very clearly, uh, they also need to have in place uh, some kind of uh, clearly thought out strategy as to how um, uh, this liberalization that is occurring uh, and in this new context uh, where uh, countries see themselves as, as uh, uh, benefiting. And uh, in this regard, uh, the uh, African Union Commission is already uh, taking steps towards um, uh, trying to come up with a continental uh, approach. Uh, one key event that happened um, just a couple of months ago in July was the first ever African e-commerce uh, conference that took place in Nairobi. Uh, and this brought together policymakers, researchers, private sector, civil society, and, and others to discuss what is required uh, of an African uh, digital economy uh, uh, strategy. Uh, one very important outcome of this meeting uh, was a recommendation uh, for the African Union Summit to appoint a digital economy champion. Um, and what this means in terms of the AU practice, as uh, Ambassador Zambeo knows very well, is that uh, it means that one African head of state uh, is given the responsibility for ensuring that this issue is on the agenda of the, of the summit. And we've seen this work very well in relation to the FCMTA negotiations, as uh, Kariba mentioned earlier, uh, where President Isufu, the president of Niger, was the champion of the negotiations and ensured that uh, regular reports to the summit to uh, have that uh, political uh, uh, drive uh, behind the whole effort. Uh, much of the progress that is being made on infrastructure development also comes out of um, having a similar arrangement at the summit level in the form of, um, I believe, the president of South Africa as the uh, AU summit champion on infrastructure. So this recommendation, if implemented, I think would help to um, pull the African countries together um, into a common uh, approach on, on, on the issue of uh, digital, on the issue of digitalization. Um, a continental digital strategy would also provide a framework uh, for developing a common African position on e-commerce at the multilateral level. I think there is no secret in saying that uh, here at the WTO, the African countries are not fully united as to how they want to deal with uh, uh, E-commerce, uh, they're certainly taking a precautionary approach, uh, uh, but the number of countries that uh, are friends of e-commerce and others that uh, are not, uh, and, and you know, so clearly uh, uh, this kind of coordination that the uh, African Union is helping to bring about would uh, address uh, this um, uh, issue. Then the second cluster of issues I want to address in, uh, in, in this phase of the uh, presentation is that in order to ensure ownership, effective implementation, and tailoring of a continental digital strategy, African countries will need to establish appropriate legal, institutional, and regulatory uh, governance uh, uh, structures uh, to engage on uh, the 
digital economy uh, issues. And uh, we know that this is beginning to happen. For example, um, uh, OMTAD uh, has worked with six African countries on e-readiness uh, strategies. Uh, we know that uh, ITC has been working with uh, Côte d'Ivoire in developing a national uh, e-strategy targeted at harnessing the industrialization opportunities the digital economy uh, offers. Um, but clearly, again, uh, that there is need for a proactive <coughs> approach uh, to ensure that um, countries are, are prepared and are looking at the pathway that um, is uh, suitable for their own uh, purposes. Then also I should say that due to the cross-sectoral uh, breadth of the digital economy, which now extends beyond what we used to call ICT, uh, horizontal integration and uh, coordination across government and with the private sector will be key. Um, for example, Senegal has established a national consultative framework to create a synergy of actions uh, to bring together e-commerce players from across the public sector, the private sector, and civil uh, society. And the development of digital capacities to utilize the opportunities and interventions uh, uh, identified on the national, regional, and continental uh, frameworks uh, will be uh, also important. This will include uh, both um, hard infrastructure as well as uh, uh, skill uh, capacities. And here, let me also say that we uh, know that a number of African countries are paying a lot of attention to this issue of skill capacities because that really is um, what drives uh, the innovation on digitalization. Um, Rwanda is emerging as a leader in this area, but there are several other countries, uh, Ghana, Kenya, uh, Senegal, that are all uh, quite active in this uh, issue of uh, skill uh, capacity. Uh, so it's the responsibility of national governments to ensure that the digital strategies result in inclusive outcomes as well and do not replace an external digital uh, divide with an internal one. And this will require policy agendas that are responsive to the constraints and needs of MSMEs and supportive uh, government schemes and innovation funds for startups and the scaling up of digital uh, firms. Um, yes, I'll just round up. Um, now, uh, at ECA, we are one of the um, uh, activities we are now engaged in is um, uh, working with uh, a number of countries uh, on their AFCFTA strategies that would include uh, how to um, uh, ensure that in this new environment uh, they are taking on the um, uh, challenges uh, that uh, need also need to be uh, addressed. So let me just uh, then conclude by saying that um, uh, we see the uh, AFCFTA as providing a context, a new approach to trade governance. Uh, Karima in her introduction uh, talked about uh, the um, post-colonial period and the uh, ups and downs, uh, failures and successes. It's the COP FNT of four. Um, but we see this as a new beginning, as providing a new approach in a changed context uh, to trade governance and, uh, and one that could um, uh, drive uh, the industrialization process in the African countries, uh, provided, of course, that um, at the national level, which is where it must all begin, uh, countries are putting in place the right responses, and this is also um, coordinated uh, across the continent, as we are seeing from the African Union, to ensure that these frameworks um, also speak to national priorities. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, and thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. Thank you very much, David, for letting us know that not only Africa is preparing itself, but Africa is already on the move and has started working not only, I would say, at the institutional level with the framework of the CFTA, but also at country and sub-regional level uh, by um, launching con very concrete activities relating to this um, to this sector and I'm sure you could have gone and on and on with these very uh, interesting examples. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you know that, uh, I mean, you have seen since yesterday that uh, a number of references 
to the SDGs and how trade can support the uh, implementation of the SDGs uh, has been uh, discussed at length. And as you know, one of the motto, not to say the main motto, of uh, Agenda 2030 is leaving no one behind. And this is, doesn't apply only to people, but it also applies to countries uh, for whom equal opportunities are to be offered. So um, as Agenda 2063 of the Africa Union is implemented in full convergence and uh, consistent with um, the SDGs, I would like to call upon you, Mr. Adipariov, the EIF, to tell us more specifically uh, about the position of the LDCs vis-à-vis -vis this whole agenda and how they can become as others and uh, the full actors of the digital aid and benefit from industrialization linked to the launch of the African Free Trade Area. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, uh, distinguished, uh, um, distinguished panelists, uh, including ambassadors um, and distinguished audience. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank UNICA for providing me this, uh, this opportunity. Now let me start with the opportunities. You know, opportunities are enormous when we are talking about LDCs, particularly LDCs in Africa. Uh, Africa as a region has tremendous potential. It, it can be seen by the fact that you know, most of the high-tech uh, uh, or tech-based tech companies uh, are uh, uh, based in uh, either in North America or, or in Asia, China, Japan, Korea, India. There are a few in uh, other, other parts of the world, including um, uh, Brazil and South Africa in, uh, in Africa. But starting with the low base, you know, there is a tremendous opportunity that, uh, that uh, Africa can uh, take advantage of. Um, I think, you know, it's not new. There are a number of countries which are already deploying, deploying digital technology. Um, the Rwanda's example is prominent. Uh, uh, and this uh, jeep line uh, using uh, uh, the transportation of blood, uh, uh, drone being used for transportation of blood to rural areas is one example. Uh, we have the example of um, uh, artificial limbs uh, being printed by using 3D printing in South Sudan, which is uh, being used uh, uh, currently. Uh, we have also heard of uh, the uh, robot working as uh, a traffic police in uh, the street uh, uh, of uh, the capital of DRC. So these are examples uh, that, uh, that exist already, and there might be uh, more, more such uh, examples. And how the digitization process will help Africa to industrialize is the theme that, that we are uh, discussing uh, this afternoon. But in, in this context, I also would like to highlight several challenges that we face. And some of the challenges have already been uh, either highlighted by, uh, by one of the speakers, uh, you know, our previous speakers, including Ambassador Bramdeo, oh, he has identified some challenges, and my dear friend uh, David also has identified the challenge. See, infrastructure is the major challenge. Uh, I mean, whether it's a, uh, it's a brick and mortar company or a digital company, or a digital sort of, um, you know, um, e-commerce company, for example. You know, the, uh, the infrastructure remains the single largest challenge. Talking about electricity as one of the uh, basic infrastructure that is required to transact uh, digitally. You know, uh, 15 countries in Africa, according to Omtak uh, 2017 report, which focused on energy, 15 countries in Africa have less than 20% uh, electricity coverage. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's already quite a start as compared to some of the LDCs in, in, in Asia where they have coverage up to 80%, including countries such as Bhutan, which has coverage up to 90%. Uh, so the, this is uh, already a major challenge. And the other major challenge is that you have to have the internet to run all of these technologies that have just been, uh, just been mentioned, whether it's uh, AI 
or uh, the uh, 3D printing uh, or, uh, or any other technologies such as blockchain. They need uh, you know 24 hour uh, internet service and they need a high bandwidth service and that doesn't exist in many uh, countries. Yesterday I was highlighting this example, I want to repeat this. In Comoros, for example, uh, only 8% uh, of the population have internet coverage, right? And then uh, internet availability for people from home is just 5%. Um, and uh, the price is so high that for one GB um, data, it costs, uh, Cost almost 20% 20, 20 of the GNI per capita of the country. So that's uh, that's the huge uh, you know digital divide that has already been mentioned. The second issue, second challenge that we face is intellectual property protection. Some of these um, you know uh, technologies are protected by intellectual property, and uh, this of course intellectual property is good to spur innovation, but at the same time you know to it restrict access unless you access some of these technologies through open sources or other kind of mechanisms. The third challenge that I face is, the, is in the area of skills. Uh, when I talk, talk about a skill uh, in relation to uh, digital technology, it is not only about secondary or tertiary education, it goes beyond that. You know, it, it is about uh, technical and vocational education. It is about involving more uh, people in, 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 uh, in um, in a studying um, STEM, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics discipline. And particularly, there exists a, not only digital divide, but also gender digital divide, where the skill component actually um, it becomes quite important in the context of women who, are, uh, who do not have access to these kind of skills. Then the issue of competition, which has been discussed, but I want to just highlight a, a point here, um, just to emphasize what has already been uh, mentioned by David. You know, there are among the techni uh, technology giants. I mentioned that you know, most of them are uh, based in North America, and for some reason, there are three companies starting with, uh, you know, all of them starting with uh, an alphabet A, uh, Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet. Alphabet is the owner of Google, by the way. Uh, so these all three companies are you know located in one single country, including other companies such as Facebook, IBM, Intel. Um, uh, so. This is the kind of concentration that we are looking at because of uh, because of this. There might be a, a chances of you know competition being um, uh, being compromised, competition and angle being compromised. So even within Africa, you have Liquid Tele Telecom, Safaricom, and others. They are consolidating their uh, uh, presence uh, and, and growth in uh, uh, Africa at this point in time. Um, and and pri uh, privacy and data protection is another important challenge I just wanted to add. So talking about uh, what is possible, you know, uh, I, I just look at uh, the kind of work that we do um, uh, and uh, together with our partners, just want to highlight some of these, uh, you know, issues uh, based on, uh, uh, on, on, on the work that we are doing. We do analytical work, diagnostic trade indication study. Uh, in, in LDCs and these DTISs, Diagnostic Trade Integration Studies, out of them half have included uh, ICT as a major priority area, either as a cross-cutting issue or uh, a separate chapter dedicated to um, uh, ICT uh, as an area. Um, and uh, most of them basically focus on hard infrastructure. Uh, but uh, Beyond that, we are also doing e-trade readiness assessment. You mentioned, uh, David, about e-trade readiness assessment that Angtar is doing. Actually, we are supporting uh, eight such e-trade readiness assessment in LDCs, and out of them, three are in Africa. We've already completed one for Liberia. We are doing one for Lesotho, and the uh, other one is in Malawi. But there are other five uh, e-trade readiness assessment that we've done in the in the Pacific and, and Asia region. And Pacific is quite quite important uh, to highlight here. See, we've done e-trade readiness assessment together with Ongta in Samoa, Vanuatu, uh, and uh, and Solomon <coughs> Island. And there's one currently being done in Tuvalu. So encouraged by the e-trade readiness assessment that we've done in the Pacific, the Pacific Island Forum Secretary is now conducting regional, regional uh, e-trade readiness assessment. Such kind of regional e-trade readiness assessment uh, is an idea that we are currently discussing in West Africa uh, with Senegal taking the lead. 
and uh, there might be a possibility to do that kind of as assessment uh, in, the, in the entire region. Uh, but then we need to go beyond the analytical work. Analytical work is enormously important, but we, we have to go beyond that. So in relation to uh, the, the, the aspects of support that we provide and that goes beyond analytical work, I just want to point, uh, point out one example that is a successful example. Unfortunately, not from Africa, but there is a lesson that can be learned. We, based on the uh, e-trade readiness assessment that was done by Ontari in Bhutan, we supported as uh, the first ever e-commerce project in Bhutan, and that is delivering significant results for, uh, uh, for for farmers who are involved in uh, in production and, and and marketing of potato, and they are going to launch the same uh, facility for the uh, the farmers who are. Um, who are involved in production of uh, um, cardamom as well. As, uh, similarly, uh, we are now uh, discussing with Rwanda with a uh, project uh, proposal on e-commerce, and there will be a potential for us to support that to support that project as well. Um, so it is it is really important for us to go beyond the analytical work in order to tackle these uh, inner challenges. The other aspect that I want to highlight is that we have to take care of infrastructure deficit. This is not only in the context of uh, Africa, but it applies to all the LDC. Since this, focus, uh, since this session focuses on Africa, there is this uh, African uh, Development Bank study that identifies a funding gap of uh, between 130 and 170 billion per year for infrastructure sector alone. This is a significant gap. And there is not even a sing not, not one single government that would be able to meet this entire uh, resource requirement. Uh, and there is a need for partnership, there is a need for cooperation. Maybe pulling resources for developing um, regional infrastructure could be one uh, way to sort of, you know, harness the potential of partnership. But going beyond the public sector's contribution, I think it's important to mobilize resources from bilateral and multilateral donors. Uh, and, and, and the private sector as well. The private sector needs to come in here in order to um, you know, uh, meet the infrastructure gap. And I'm happy to note that investment uh, is one of the areas in, uh, in which uh, there will be a, a, a discussion in the second round of uh, a negotiation of uh, um, African continental featured areas. <coughs> uh, I think that will facilitate the process of mobilizing resources from the private sector. The third important point that I would like to highlight is the logistics. See, uh, whether it's a brick and mortar company, as I said earlier, or the e-commerce uh, companies, companies engaged in e-commerce, uh, the implementation of uh, trade facilitation agreement, uh, or, or even going beyond that, um, uh, implementing paperless trade kind of agreement would be critically important in order to um, in order to facilitate trade across the border. Uh, in uh, in East Africa, I think we've already seen results, thanks to um, a lot of our partners, including Trademark East Africa, and, and the governments that have done a lot of good work already there. I'll just give you one example of Gambia, where we have supported the construction of uh, uh, the air cargo complex in the Banjul International Airport, as a result of which the the, the time and cost of uh, a transaction in, 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 in Banjul, in, uh, International Airport has been reduced by 50 percent. So these are a uh, few models based on which uh, you know uh, the um, other countries can sort of you know replicate uh, and, and take advantage of. But there's more support that they needed. And the the final point that I would like to uh, make, and this also relates to what uh, what some of you have already mentioned, is is the policy. You have to get the policy right. You know, it is it is not only about enabling policy but also mitigate the policy, because we've talked about opportunities as well as challenges. In order to harness the potential, we need you know, enabling policies, such as policies around um, uh, ICT, um, uh, information and communication technology, policies around skill as they relate to a uh, uh, broader issue of education and skill. The trade policy, whether it's, uh, it's, it's important to continue to tax uh, the uh, digital products at a, at a higher uh, price or a higher rate or, or, or to reduce uh, uh, the tax on these products, particularly in the context of uh, the regional integration. <coughs> this is important to highlight. The other aspect would be the fiscal uh, policy. 
fiscal policy is important from the perspective of the fact that if you want to really encourage innovation in the country, uh, you have to invest in research and development. The public sector spending on research and development is bound to be limited. In order to encourage the private sector to invest on research and development, maybe there is a, a need for providing some kind of fiscal incentive, right? So that's one of uh, uh, the enabling policy. But the mitigation policy becomes also critically important. And there I would like to highlight competition policy as one of the major elements of mitigating policy. I'm, I'm really happy to note that there's already a discussion on the regional competition, um, uh, you know, competition policy at the, at, at the CEF, uh, TA, AFC, TA level. Um, the other important aspect is the safety net policy because there can be possibility of job losses in order to retrain people to move from one sector to another. It's important to have safety net and retra retraining and retooling uh, policies. And finally, finally, the important policy measure that that all the countries in Africa and LDCs will have to uh, uh, put to put in place is the policy on data protection. I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing with us the LDC perspective and for um, reaffirming that uh, we should not stop at the level of the studies and the analytical work that this has to be translated into action, so if we want really the agenda to move forward. So we have seen how the LDCs were approached, the, 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 the positioning of the LDC was approached from, I would say, an institutional uh, perspective. Now maybe I will move to a country perspective and uh, give the floor to um, His Excellency Ambassador Kamba, who will let us know more about what his country or what Uh, the, the LDC group is doing in this context. Merci, euh, Madame la Directrice. Merci, euh, chers collègues. Euh, C'est très difficile de prendre la parole après des éminents interlocuteurs comme vous, mais je vais essayer, à ma qualité de coordonnateur du groupe de PMA, de vous livrer ce que nous pensons sur ce défi que euh, comment tirer parti les possibilités d'industrialisation dans la zone de libre échange continentale africaine à l'ère numérique. Euh, mes réflexions sur la thématique d'aujourd'hui me mènent à dire en effet que la zone de libre échange continentale sert à favoriser l'industrialisation du pays, du continent d'abord et du pays à travers la création d'un environnement réglementaire propice au développement des chaînes de valeur régionales. Pour que ces chaînes de valeur régionales deviennent véritablement opérationnelles entre les pays d'une même sous-région africaine ou à l'échelle plus large du continent africain, l'utilisation des technologies de l'information et des télécommunications est indispensable. Que ce soit simplement dans le cadre du maintien de contacts faciles, et permanent entre les acteurs privés de deux pays ou plus, impliqués dans une même chaîne d'approvisionnement, ou plus spécifiquement dans le cadre des processus de production de produits en, entre eux-mêmes. La quatrième révolution industrielle et le numérique offrent de grandes potentialités en termes de fluidification des échanges commerciaux et d'augmentation du nombre de produits et de services vendus, que ce soit des produits de services finis ou bien intermédiaires. En somme, ce que l'ère numérique peut nous apporter, c'est une accélération du processus d'industrialisation au niveau de tous les acteurs d'activité et un accroissement de la diversification des économies. Parmi les défis que pose l'appropriation et l'utilisation de la technologie numérique, il y a non seulement le fait de veiller à ce que celle-ci soit bien pourvoyée d'emplois dans nos pays, vous comprendrez qu'un pays comme le mien ne peut pas espérer que dans ce cadre-là, elle serait pour elle l'emploi, a priori. Mais il y a également l'enjeu fondamental de maîtriser complètement cette technologie numérique. Ce dernier aspect nécessite à la fois des ressources humaines très bien formées, mais également des cadres réglementaires solides et bien préparés qui encadrent avec sécurité toutes les opérations de commerce qui peuvent découler de l'utilisation du numérique et des outils de l'information et de la télécommunication. Je ne vous dirai pas qu'il n'y a pas de rose sans épines, 
Il y a la, la cybercriminalité en ce qui concerne l'utilisation du numérique, dont nous, pays en développement, n'avons pas les moyens de contrer. Le premier aspect dont il faut tenir compte est celui de la protection des données. C'est ce que je disais, que ce soit celle des entreprises ou celle des particuliers. Mon pays, comme la, la plupart des PMA en particulier, sont loin de, tout, de, 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 de tous procéder les dotations nécessaires à cette protection. Donc, il y a un aspect législatif, réglementaire. Seulement 40% des PMA africains disposent, en 2016, selon les données de la CNESED, d'une législation contre la cybercriminalité. Pour ce qui est de la protection des consommateurs en particulier, Seulement 26% des PMA africains possèdent en 2016 une législation dans ce sens. Par ailleurs, sur le plan du matériel nécessaire à la protection des données, en d'autres termes, la possession de serveurs Internet sécurisés, utilisant des paramètres de chiffrement, les PMA n'en possèdent que l'équivalent de 1 pour 1 million d'habitants contre l'équivalent de 800 pour un million d'habitants sur les pays à haut revenu, toujours selon les données de la en 2016. Bref, il y a là des insuffisances institutionnelles et infrastructurelles certaines. Il va falloir combler rapidement et de manière ex ante avant de pouvoir tirer concrètement bénéfice des avantages du numérique dans le cadre des opérations de commerce interne et externe. Cela vaut pour la majorité des paiements, y compris pour la République centrafricaine mon pays. L'AFLEC, les négociations qui se poursuivent dans le cadre de la phase 2 de l'élaboration des règles communautaires devraient avoir le, leur mot à dire sur la conception des législations nationales en matière de protection des données et de transactions électroniques. Non seulement la mise en œuvre de l'AFLEC doit pleinement prendre en compte la nécessité de l'existence de ces législations nationales, sur la protection des données, mais également l'ASLEC devrait veiller à ce que les législations soient harmonieuses entre les pays, ceci de manière à ne pas induire des entraves au commerce électronique qui peut être généré par le numérique et les technologies d'information et de la télécommunication. En outre, l'ASLEC, dans la finalisation de la conception de son cadre réglementaire, devrait faire en sorte que les règles communautaires établies en matière d'investissement soit de nature à favoriser l'émergence de plans de financement transnationaux, de projets d'infrastructures liés aux capacités d'accès à la population et des entreprises à Internet et au haut débit. À ce niveau également, il existe effectivement un manque important, en particulier chez les PMA. Si l'Afrique et les PMA ne disposent pas ex ante des infrastructures de base nécessaires, alors il serait impossible de bénéficier véritablement des avantages de la quatrième révolution industrielle et nous serons largement dépassés. Selon les données de l'Union internationale des télécommunications, aujourd'hui seulement à peine 10% de la population des PMA africains utilise l'Internet, contre plus de 70% de la population des pays de l'OCDE. Vous voyez l'écart. Quant à l'accès à l'Internet à haut débit, seuls 0,3% des PMA africains possèdent un abonnement haut débit contre plus de 30% de la population chez les pays de l'OCDE. La fracture numérique est donc ici très claire entre ceux qui ont les moyens de bénéficier des avantages de la quatrième révolution industrielle et ceux qui, pour l'instant, ne sont pas prêts à en bénéficier pleinement, même si l'Afrique se dynamise ici et là en matière de commerce électronique, comme avec l'apparition de l'Union Julien, qui représente un écosystème de belles entreprises de commerce électronique actives dans 23 pays africains. L'industrialisation accélérée de l'Afrique et le succès de l'objectif d'intégration économique continentale voulu à travers la mise en place de la ZLEC ne pourraient être atteints que si les préalables en termes d'infrastructures matérielles et institutionnelles relatives au commerce électronique sont atteints. Cela va également demander beaucoup d'efforts et des politiques économiques coordonnées au niveau des États africains. C'est là que la ZLEC et l'Union africaine jouent un rôle important. Enfin, une dimension à ne pas négliger dans notre objectif commun d'industrialisation et d'intégration économique de l'Afrique, c'est qu'au-delà de la capacité d'appréhender la technologie numérique et à des fins de commerce électronique et de promotion des chaînes de valeur régionales, il demeure une condition nécessaire à l'intégration et à l'expansion du commerce continental. Il s'agit 
de la facilitation du commerce et de la disponibilité des infrastructures de transport à l'État. C'est là l'un des plus gros défis de l'Afrique et des PMA notamment. Les pays ont besoin de financement conséquent et d'investir dans la construction et l'entretien des réseaux routiers trans transafricains plus nombreux. S'agissant des réseaux transafricains, je parle aussi du contrôle de la CEA, euh, il y a plus de 40 ans, je dirais même beaucoup plus, lorsqu'il y a eu le projet mombasa Lagos, et jusqu'à l'heure où je vous parle, je ne sais pas où est-ce qu'on en est, mais c'est une interrogation. Les réseaux ferrés sont également à développer, ainsi que le trafic maritime et aérien. À ce jour, les coûts de transaction et d'achinement des biens sont encore trop élevés entre les pays africains. Je crois que mes prédécesseurs en ont parlé. Même nos voisins, les coûts de transport peuvent multiplier les prix de produits d'un point A à un point B sans que la marchandise n'ait quitté le territoire. D'où l'intérêt du numérique. Ainsi, si le commerce électronique permet à un consommateur issu, par exemple, de la région centrafricaine, d'acheter techniquement sur une plateforme électronique un produit fabriqué au Bénin, ou inversement, quel va être le prix à payer cela vaudra peut-être moins cher d'acheter de même produit en Europe et de se l'envoyer par avion. C'est donc là un impératif pour l'Afrique, pour une véritable industrialisation accélérée de l'Afrique. L'appropriation de la technologie numérique doit aller de pair avec une meilleure facilitation des échanges. Cette dernière doit se faire sur le terrain et dans le cadre législatif, notamment en conformité avec l'accord sur la facilitation de l'OMC signé par nos ministères à Bali en 2013. Ceux qui le savent doivent s'en rappeler. Voilà, Madame la Directrice, chers collègues, euh, chers auditeurs, cette thématique consacrée à l'industrialisation de l'Afrique, à la ZELEC et à l'ère numérique. Ceci étant, je terminerai par cette métaphore en disant euh, l'ère numérique, c'est comme un train. Nous sommes obligés de le prendre. Même si dedans, on a le mal de mer, comme on dit le mal de voiture, le mal de train. On est obligé de le prendre parce que c'est inévitable. Euh, si nous voulons avancer, nous sommes obligés de le prendre. Mais pas à n'importe quelle condition. Il ne faut pas qu'on rentre dedans et qu'on ait le mal de temps. Merci. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, euh, Excellence, pour euh, avoir partagé vos vues sur la question. Euh, le train est parti, il n'est plus en gare. Donc il va falloir que nous nous euh, organisions pour euh, au moins sauter dedans. Et merci d'avoir de, convaincu les, les participants qu'une attention et qu'un accompagnement très particulier sont nécessaires pour combler les déficits et, 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 et les retards qui sont accusés euh, par les PMA pour leur éviter le mal de train. Merci beaucoup. Donc, uh, merci. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the program, uh, there should have been a session where I would have myself interacted with the panelists, and I have plenty of questions and reactions to them. But I think it would be unfair to close the session that has to close in very few minutes without giving you the floor. Um, I myself have noticed that there were two main areas that have come as a, a recurrent one, one in terms of how to prepare ourselves, in terms of skills, people and institutional skills, uh, people and institutional capacity, and at the same time, uh, an emphasis has been put on protection, and let me share with you, a few years ago I have started working in the ICT sector. And a metaphor, since uh, His Excellency has just shared the metaphor, was that when you buy a hammer, there is nothing in the hammer saying, be careful, this instrument can be dangerous. So let us try to maximize the gains and the advantages. Be careful about the potential dangers, but not overestimate the danger of moving towards the digital age. But, uh, age. but this is something I throw to the, the, the comments, maybe, of, of, of our participants. And we can discuss them further, even bilaterally, for those who don't. So, participants, I hope you are not rushing to other sessions, and we can have, take two or three minutes to get questions from you. Anyone wants to?
I know it was very clear and comprehensive. <laughs> Maybe it is the last part of the day and you may be a little tired also. So shall we just adjourn the session here after having thanked very warmly our eminent panelists for being with us and for sharing their thoughts and their views about this subject. Thank you very much.